If you look with me at Revelation 2, verse 18, we're going to see today that this church was in a world of trouble. We're going to see what Jesus has to say to this church and what Jesus said to this church in many ways, matter of fact, I will say really in every way, applies directly to our lives today and to our church today. I believe we are living in the Laodicean church age, but as we're going to see later in this text, Jesus tells this church, hold fast until I come. And I believe there are problems that are in this church that is going to remain with the church of Jesus all the way until his coming, whether that be in our lifetimes or should the Lord tarry in those who come after us. And so this scripture is highly Relatable, highly applicable to our lives today. So notice with me, we're just going to unpack this, unfold this. Are you enjoying some of the history that comes with these churches? To me, it brings the text. uh, It helps me understand it better. So I'll share with you a little bit of history of Thyatira, and then we'll break down what Jesus said and why he says it in the manner that he does. Notice verse 18, chapter 2 of Revelation. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze. Now why does Jesus address the church? Why does he address the city of Thyatira like this? Well, let's understand a little bit about the city of Thyatira. We've studied the city of Ephesus, the city of Smyrna, the city of Pergamum, and now we're in the city of Thyatira. Now, while all of these other cities were quite important, it's really interesting that Thyatira really was not all that important in the grand scheme of things in Asia Minor. As a matter of fact, of the seven cities that we're going to study, of the seven churches, Thyatira was the smallest And it was the least of all the seven. And while Thyatira is the smallest of all the seven cities, they receive the longest of Christ's letters. Isn't that interesting? Jesus had more to say to what is seemingly an unimportant city than all the others. Ephesus could boast that they were the capital. Smyrna could boast of their gorgeous and enormous harbor off the Aegean Sea. Pergamum could boast of their great mountains and they boasted of their academia. And all of these cities had stadiums and libraries and theaters. But no, Thyatira was actually quite small. They didn't have the defenses that other cities had. As a matter of fact, the city sat in a deep valley. And their only protection was a Roman garrison. There really were only two types of people who lived in the city of Thyatira. There were Roman soldiers, of course. And then there were tradespeople, craftsmen, merchants. If you lived in Thyatira, you were part of what was called a trade guild, which would have been like a trade union or a labor union. If you were a cobbler, if you were a blacksmith, if you were a leather tanner, if you were a potter, if you were um, a a maker of garments or whatever craft or whatever trade you were in, you were required to be part of a guild or a part of a trade union. We'll talk about that just a little bit later in the text. But really, only Roman soldiers and tradespeople lived here. And the one thing that Thyatira was really known for in the ancient world, what they were famous for, was their purple dyed garments. Now this is interesting. Because the only other time that Thyatira is mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Acts. Does anyone remember a lady that Paul led to Christ named Lydia? Isn't Lydia such a pretty name? Lydia was a businesswoman. And according to the book of Acts, she was a seller of purple garments. And she was from the city of Thyatira. Now the Bible doesn't say this. This is just my personal hunch. But no doubt Lydia probably had a hand in helping start the church of Thyatira. 
She was converted under the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and she was actually the first European convert recorded in the Bible. And she sold purple linens. In that day, in this ancient city, they would take a murex. It was a shellfish from the Mediterranean Sea. They would transport it to Thyatira, and out of this small shellfish came this purple dye, and that's how they dyed these garments. Historians tell us that it was so rare and it was so costly to have a purple garment. Mostly it was reserved for royalty. Do you remember the story two weeks ago in the church of Smyrna when we told of the martyrdom of Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna? A detail that I left out was when he stood before the Roman governor of Smyrna, Polycarp had on a dusty tunic. But that Roman governor... He wore purple and gold fine garments. But these merchants began to make it available. And history historians tell us that one pound of purple dyed linen would be what is equivalent in our dollars today to $300 per pound. These were very costly. And this is what the city was known for. But there's another thing the city of Thyatira was known for, their patron god, the god that they worshipped. Of course, in this time in world history, Greek mythology was worshipped as gods. Remember in Pergamum, they had an altar built to Zeus, 100 feet wide, 40 feet tall, jutted out of the mountain, and it was in the shape of a throne. And what did Jesus tell Pergamum in our text last week? I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Well, in Greek mythology, and this was, this, these were the gods that they worshipped at this time, Christians were thought to be godless because they refused to worship this mythology. In Greek mythology, they worshipped Apollo. And Apollo was the son of who? Zeus. Is it any wonder that when Jesus addresses... Now remember, when he addresses each of the churches, one of the things I love about the seven letters to the churches is the crystal clear format that Jesus follows. He introduces to the angel of the particular city, and then he addresses the church, and he introduces himself in a different way of which John 1 describes, and that was our introduction sermon to the series called Christ and His Church. And remember with Ephesus, he said, I am the one who holds the seven stars and walks among the golden candlesticks. And to Smyrna he said, I was the first and the last. I am the one who is dead but is now alive again. Remember we said the city of Smyrna, that was their logo, their motto. The city that was dead but is alive again. Do you remember to Pergamum he came with a double-edged sword out of his mouth. Why? Because the Roman proconsul of the city was known for his mighty sword. Well, in a similar way, he's going to come to the city of Thyatira. And what he's going to say is, I am the Son of God. It's interesting that in the book of Revelation, all of the titles of Christ, the bright and morning star, the alpha and omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the, the, the one who is dead and is alive again, the Lamb of God, of all the titles for Jesus in the book of Revelation, this is the only place that the Son of God is mentioned. The only one. Is it coincidence to you that the people, that the city of Thyatira, their patron God was Apollo, the sun god, the son of Zeus. And Jesus tells the people of this city, no, I am the son of God. Amen. And now notice how Jesus is going to introduce himself. He's going to introduce himself to this church as a judge. Notice what he says. He has eyes like a flame of fire. Now why does Jesus describe himself this way? Friends, this is what it's saying. The eyes of God sees everything. What he's going to rebuke this church for is their sexual immorality. Their idol worship. Their adultery. 
In other words, Jesus is saying, what you are doing behind closed doors that you don't think people know, I see it because I have eyes like a flame of fire. Nothing escapes the eyes of God. Do you remember last week when we were in the city of Pergamum, Jesus came to them and said that he was the one who had the double-edged sword. Out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. Do you remember we referenced Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where the Bible says the word of God is alive, it is active, it is powerful, it is sharper than any double-edged sword. Well, friends, do you know what the next verse says? Hebrews 4, verse 13, that the eyes of the Lord sees everything. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Everything is laid naked before him. He sees it all. And this is what he's saying to the people of Thyatira. You want to hold on to your sin. You want to embrace your sin. But what you do behind closed doors, Jesus well sees. He is the Son of God with eyes that pierce the darkness, eyes that see in secret, eyes that are a flame of fire. And then notice he says, he has feet like burnished bronze, or some translations say fine brass. Anytime you see brass in the Bible or bronze in the Bible, it speaks of judgment. You know what Jesus is saying to this church? I'm coming in judgment. I will judge sin. Friends, I don't have to tell you. The gospel that our culture needs today, the message that this society needs today, the word from God that this church age needs today is that of repentance. That of confessing and forsaking our sins. That is what we need to hear from the Holy Spirit today. So let's pay careful attention to what Jesus says. Now first, he's going to say some words of commendation to this church. Notice verse 19. It's very interesting. Jesus is going to tell this church in a similar way to what he told Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. He says, I know your works. I notice what they are. He says, I notice your, I I see your faith. Sorry. I see your love. I see your service. I see your patience, your endurance. And that your latter works exceed the former. Huh. I mean, if, if uh, I tell you, if, if I was going to be part of a, of a church, these are some of the things I think I'd be looking for, wouldn't you? A church that worked, a church that Loved, a church that had faith, a church that had service. That's where we get our word deacon, those who serve. A church that the, the latter was even greater than the former. They're growing in their good works. This would appear to be a very good and a very solid and a stable church. But how many of you know, so it is for a church as it is in the Christian life. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. That's what matters. Not so much how you start, it's how are you going to finish. And we're going to see this church does not finish well. While they had some things commendable, while the Lord saw these good things about them, notice what he says in verse 20, Nevertheless, but I have some things against you. I have this against you. You have tolerated this woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, who teaches and seduces my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat foods offered to idols. Now, what's Jesus saying here? Notice, I want you, if you're going to take notes today, I want you to note the word tolerate here. Now, my friends, I hope that you recognize that you and I are living in a very dangerous hour. Are you aware of this? And are you aware of what the Bible says is happening right now in our society? The Bible says that in the last days, it will be perilous. In other words, dangerous times. Do you think we're living in dangerous times? Did you hear that gun sales for the month of June shattered all records? 
Do you know why gun sales are shattering records right now? It's because we have raised a generation that is absolutely lawless. And do you know what we're seeing on the streets of our nation right now? We're seeing lawlessness on a grand scale. And the Bible says that in the last days, the love of many is going to wax cold. And the Bible says in the last days, men will become lawless, lovers of self more than lovers of God. Are we seeing that today? The Bible says in the last days that there will be a form of godliness, but people would deny the power thereof. Are we seeing that today? Friends, we are in the last of the last days. And we're watching these things unfold. We're watching them happen right now. And we are in a very dangerous time right now. There are currents flowing through our society. There are currents happening that are rapid currents of change moving through our culture. And I'm warning you today, do not get swept down these currents. Pray over your children. Talk to your children. Educate your children. Teach your children scripture. Teach them godliness. And warn your children not to be swept down these fast-moving currents of cultural change. What we're seeing is very dangerous. And the world needs the voice of the church right now like never before. Would you agree with that? But let me tell you why our voice does not matter as it should. Let me tell you why we've lost some of our saltiness, as Jesus said. Do you know why our voice is not penetrating the darkness like it should? Because there are two ideas right now that is destroying the church of Jesus Christ. Number one, it's relevance. Somehow we've got in our eye, somehow we've gotten in our minds that the church needs to be relevant to the world. Friends, it is not biblical. I'm not saying that we be stuck in past methods. Listen, methods are always going to change. Styles are always going to change. Preferences are always... I'm not asking about your preference today. But let me tell you, the Word of God never changes. Methods change, preferences change, styles change. All these things change. But the truth of the Word of God will never change. And our sole responsibility in this present evil age is not to attract the world. It is to soundly convert the world. And you don't convert the world by trying to attract them. You don't convert the world by changing over to them. That's not how you convert the world. You convert the world through the heralding, through the preaching, through the proclaiming, through the living of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way God has ordained to do such a work. Relevance is destroying the church. We are not to woo the world. We are not to attract the world. We are to convert the world. The second thing, and this is what we see in the text... The second idea that is destroying the influence of the church right now is tolerance. Isn't it odd that those who attack biblical principles, those who attack those of us who will stand upon the Word of God, those of us who will live the Word of God in our own lives, isn't it odd that they call us intolerant? Have you noticed that? They call us intolerant. But the moment that we speak up on anything, who are we immediately? We're intolerant, but what are they? Absolutely intolerant. Well, did you know the Bible teaches tolerance? There is a biblical word for tolerance. Christians should be tolerant, to be quite honest with you. And let me show you the biblical tolerance and let me show you the worldly tolerance. Christians should be quite tolerant. And do you know what the biblical word for tolerant is? Forbearance. We should forbear with one another. So let me give you an example. My children are very young right now. They're nine, seven, three, and not even two yet. Two in November. I don't know how my children will turn out. I don't know if my children will serve the Lord yet. Time will tell. I pray for them. I instruct them. I pray with them. I take every opportunity I can to speak into their life. But I don't know if all my children will serve the Lord. 
I hope so. I pray so. I work toward it. But let's just say that one of my children decide to walk away from God and walk away from the faith. Let's say one of my children decide to live a very sinful lifestyle. As a parent, am I to tolerate their sin? Well, think with me. What are the biblical words for tolerance? In one sense, as a parent, I am to tolerate their sin. In one sense, now follow me on this, in the biblical sense, I am to forbear with my children. I'm to speak life into them. I'm to be salt to them. I am to be light to them. I am to be that voice of God in their life, speaking, even as adults, speaking into them. This is not who God has made you. You're away from the Lord. You need to get right with God. I'm praying for you. In one sense, I forbear. In one sense, I tolerate what is going on. And I forbear. But this is not the word Jesus used for tolerance. Listen to the word that Jesus used for tolerance. This word, the biblical word for for tolerance is forbearance. But the worldly word for tolerance is this. Condoning. As a parent, I am never ever to condone sin in my children's lives. I am to never condone unrighteousness. Should one of my children walk away from the Lord, should one of my children be in sin, yes, I forbear with them. Yes, I love them. I speak into them. But I am never, ever to condone it. And this is where this church was. They tolerated this prophetess. They tolerated this sexual immorality. They tolerated. In other words, they condoned what was going on. Jesus is going to say, I'm going to judge all of those who commit adultery with her. What's he mean by that? See, what was happening is in the city of Thyatira, you had to belong to a trade guild. So say you were a blacksmith. You had to belong to do business. You had to belong to that trade guild. Well, if that trade union, for every trade union, they had their own God and their own temple. So that meant that I would have had to participate in their festivals. I would have had to participate in their rituals. I would have had to participate in what the union was doing. And apparently there was a woman who had a spirit of Jezebel about her. Now, the real Jezebel of the Old Testament had been dead about 500 years to this point. But he's talking about the spirit of Jezebel. Who was Jezebel in the Old Testament? She married King Ahab. And she was a foreigner. She was pagan worship. An idolater. And Jezebel mixed. See, she didn't just force Israel to not worship God. Here was her sin. She was perverted. She mixed idol worship with worship with God. It was a mixing of religions. And what came soon after? Sexual immorality. And she led Israel astray. And she had a horrendous ending, my friends. If you've never read The Death of Jezebel, read it for yourself. It was a miserable end. But now, hundreds of years later, Jesus calls what's going on in this church the spirit of Jezebel. Now, this is my persuasion. You're welcome to disagree. But scholars tell us that there was a woman in this city. And I happen to believe this is who Jesus is referencing. Her name was Sambe. Sambe was over a temple of this city that was a fortune-telling temple. And let me just say, let me just speak by the Holy Spirit right now. If you are someone that you dabble in fortune telling, you dabble in tarot cards, or you have a daily horoscope on your phone that you check every day, and listen, listen what the Bible calls it. The Bible calls these things divination, and it is wickedness unto the Lord. Do you understand? When you check a horoscope, you are practicing divination. You are participating in witchcraft. And and listen, God calls it wickedness. It's my understanding, of course you know I'm blind, but it's my understanding that right down the road there's some kind of palm reading, uh, fortune telling business down here. Is it still in business? Listen, it's wickedness. 
It's witchcraft. It's paganism. And it's against the Lord. And this woman named Sambe was this uh, community leader, and she was over this fortune-telling temple. And according to scholars, she had a false conversion to Christianity. And she came into the church. And apparently the church leader said, well, she's an important figure in our community. She obviously is a well-equipped teacher. Let her teach. My friends, do you realize that everyone who says they are of the Lord are not of the Lord? Do you realize that 1 John 4, 1 instructs us, test the spirits. See if they are of the Lord. Test the spirits. Now say amen if you're with me right now. Not everyone you see on television is preaching the gospel. Not everyone you see on YouTube is preaching the gospel. You have to be wise and you have to be discerning. And apparently in this church, they lost all discernment. And they allowed this woman who called herself a prophetess to come into the church and begin teaching. And apparently what she began to say is, listen, I know you're a part of the blacksmith trade guild. I know you're part of the cobbler trade guild. I know you're part of the leather tanning trade guild. I know that, I know that, that you make purple linens and you have to go to these festivals and you got to go to the rituals. Listen, practice the sexual immorality. God understands. God knows the pressure you're under. And you're fine. God will not mind. And she began teaching and seducing God's people into sin. Friends, you and I have to be very discerning in this age. When you listen to someone preach, you need to be careful. Are they preaching the truth of the word of God. Amen. I'm not interested in hearing someone's opinion. I want to know what thus saith the Lord. And that's all I want to know. Are you testing the spirits to see. Are they of the Lord. Is it biblical. Is it truth. I heard one pastor say and it's so true. And I love this. And it's, and it's very very true. He said you know Jesus, Jesus said. That wolves would come. How? How are they dressed? In sheep's clothing. Wolves speak our same language. Did you know that? Bah. And we'll hear someone preach and say, oh, well, that's of the Lord because that's how I talk. Oh, I recognize that. And I love how this pastor said it, and it's so true. He, he said this, and, and I agree fully. He said, you know, false teachers don't wear big badges that say, I am a deceiver. They don't come on television and say, welcome to our program. I'm your local neighborhood deceiver. They don't do that, do they? You have to be discerning. We have to test the spirits to see if they are of the Lord. And what happened is this woman who I think is this Sambe, came into the church, called herself a prophetess, declared herself being from God. And listen, we ought not to be gullible. Not everyone who says they're of the Lord is of the Lord. Test it. Test it according to the word of God. Test what they say. Test their character. And so this woman comes in and she begins teaching and her teaching leads to seducing and now all of a sudden there's sexual immorality happening within the church and now watch what Jesus is going to say talking about some harsh words he said I gave her time to repent but she refused to repent from her sexual immorality hmm Now look what he's going to say. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed. Now I find that fascinating. To me, it's as though Jesus is saying, you love the bed so much. You love your sexual immorality. You love the bedroom. You love your bed. I'll prepare a bed for you. These are harsh words by the Savior. And then he says, all those who practice adultery with her, I will throw into great distress. And then look what he says. Unless you repent. 
even in his eyes a flame of fire, even in his feet as fine brass judgment, Christ still calls for repentance. Isn't that remarkable to you? But Jesus has more hard things to say. He says, and to her children I will strike dead. And then the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. What's he saying? I am he who knows it all. I know your motive. I know your lust. I know what you do in secret. I know what you do that you think no one else knows. My judgment is coming swiftly unless you repent. And then look what he says. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, the ones that you've not held to her teaching. Listen, God always has a remnant. Amen. God always has a people. The question is, what side are you on? Are you among God's remnant today? Or are you among the fake? Are you among the phony? Are you among those who are playing religious games? Are you among those who you would rather just play on your phone and you'd rather play on a tablet and you'd rather go about and embrace your sin and love your sin rather than hear what the Spirit would say to the churches? Which are you today? Are you part of God's remnant or... Are you going to be among those that judgment will fall? And he says, but to the rest of you that you do not hold to her teachings. Listen to what he says. I will not lay any other burden on you. But notice, he, he also says in this text, I will repay each according to their work. Listen, remember, salvation is an individual response. Obedience is an individual response. No matter what kind of sexual immorality is in this auditorium today, I'm not going to follow your path. Jesus says, I will repay to each according to his works. To the one who overcomes. To the one who conquers. I don't care what you do. I'm not going to follow your sin. I'm going to conquer. I'm going to obey Christ no matter what. No matter who goes with me or who walks out of my life. Amen? So he says, only hold fast until I come. Amen. Now Jesus is going to say some wonderful things here. He said the hard things. He's, he's warned the church. Friends, he's warning us today. He's warning us. Is your life rampant with sin? Are you doing things behind closed doors that... You think you're getting by, but you're forgetting the eyes, a flame of fire. You're forgetting that there is a judgment to come. You're forgetting that God sees all things. He's warning us today. Will you listen to the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ? And will you listen to his invitation? He's not casting you away today. He's not saying you've sinned, you've done wrong, and therefore... I'm done with you. No, it's the exact opposite. He says, will you repent today while there's time? God is giving you time right now. If there is breath in your lungs, God is giving you time to repent. Will you listen? Will you hear what the Spirit says to you today? If God is convicting your heart, then the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If God is, is bringing you to a place where you say, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want sin any longer. I want out of this. I want to walk away from it. Then friends, that's the Holy Spirit leading you to repentance. Will you follow Him? Or will you follow your sin? And so this is what Jesus says to the one who conquers. Oh, how I hope you'll be that one. How I hope you'll be numbered among the redeemed. I hope you'll be among those who will be around the throne of God in Revelation 4 and 5. Because you've repented of your sin. He says to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes. Listen to what he says. He will be given authority to rule. Now what does Jesus mean by this? He'll be given authority to rule the nations. And as the clay pots are broken... And he goes on and, and uh, what's he talking? He, he's, he's, 
I don't want to get way off into this, but let me just reference it so you know the meaning of it. He is referencing Psalms chapter 2. If you read Psalm 2, it is beautiful. And it completely parallels with what Christ will be giving, given by the Father and what you and I will share In other words, what Jesus is saying, he's speaking of the millennial kingdom. He's speaking of that time at the end of Revelation. After all of human history begins to wrap up, he's going to reign a thousand years on this earth, the Bible teaches. He's referencing Psalm 2. He's referencing Isaiah chapter 11. And what he's saying is that you will reign with me in my kingdom. In other words, he's saying if you repent of your sin, you'll reign with Christ. That's what he's saying. If you repent in this life, you'll reign in the life to come. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying there's a promise, there's a future, there's a hope, there's a reason to live right. Friends, are you just living for this hour? Are you just living for today? Are you living for right now, this moment in your life? Or are you living for eternity? Are you living for what's truly going to matter for all of eternity? I'm telling you, my friends, the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gain the entire world but lose his soul? And I don't care what you gain in this life. If you lose your soul, it won't be worth it. And so he gives time to repent and he says those who repent will rule with me they will reign with me and then look what he says oh this is such a beautiful verse verse 28 and I will give him the morning star oh now what does Jesus mean I will give him the morning star do you realize that in Revelation twenty two sixteen, Christ is called the bright morning star you know what I believe this references the coming of Christ I believe this is speaking of Christ's return when the world is at its darkest and right now it's at least it's the darkest of my lifetime when the world is at its darkest do you know When you see the morning star, just before the dawn. (laughs) You know what Jesus is saying? His coming is going to usher in the dawning of a new day. Amen. And the darkness of this world, the sin of this world, the hostility of this world, the godlessness of this world, the unrighteousness of this world, the lawlessness of this world, it is going to pass away. And with this dawning of a new day, the bright and morning star, you and I will reign. We will rule with Jesus Christ if you conquer sin in this life. Do you see what you're forfeiting by practicing adultery? Do you see, my precious friend, what you're forfeiting in your fornication? Do you see what you're forfeiting in idol worship, in fortune telling? Do you see what you're forfeiting in your sin? You're forfeiting this glorious hope, this blessed hope, this promise of an incredible eternity with the bright and morning star Jesus Christ himself if you conquer sin if you repent if you overcome sin Christ will accept you and then lastly in verse 29 what does he say as he has said to every church in every letter and as he will say in every in all seven letters he who has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Will that be you today? Will you hear what the Holy Spirit's saying? I'm going to ask you to stand today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to make an appeal today. First, my first appeal are to you precious believers who you have loved ones who are not ready. You have children who are not ready. 
You have grandchildren that are not ready. I want to pray for you this morning. More so, I want to invite you around this altar. We have people who will pray with you, deacons, deacons' wives, other leaders. We have people who want to pray for you, pray with you. Listen, you need to bring your families today and you need to lay them on the altar and say, Lord Jesus, time is running out. Time is growing short. Convict my family of their sin. Open their eyes. Bring your grace. Bring your love. Bring your mercy. Bring your compassion, Lord God. Bring salvation in Jesus' name. And I want to admonish you, mom and dad. I want to admonish you, grandparent, great-grandparent. Do not condone the sin of your children. I don't care how old they are. I don't care what stage of life they're in. Do not condone their sin. Stand fast. Hold fast until the Lord comes. But don't condone it. Forbear. Oh, give your children forbearance. Weep over them. Cry out to the Lord over them. Be like Hannah. Lock hold of the horns of the altar. Pour your heart out to God over them. But oh, do not condone their sin. Do not condone it. Draw a line in the sand. Stop condoning. Start interceding. And get in the devil's way in your children's life. Get in his way. Get in his way. Stop being passive. Stop being agreeable. Stop signing peace treaties with the devil over your children's life. It's not worth it. It's not worth their soul. Forbear with them, but don't condone, don't tolerate. And now I want to give an appeal today. Those of you who you are not ready for the return of Christ, your life is not ready. I don't care what it is. If it's immorality, if, it's, if, it's, if, if your Ephesus and your love for the Lord has grown cold, if you've left your first love, uh, no matter what it is, some of you, so I can feel the Holy Spirit speaking right now. You lie about everything. You lie. I'm telling you, he with an eye of fire sees it. He with brass feet sees the lying in your life. You need to repent of it today. You need to forsake it today and say, I'm going to become a person of truth. God put truth in my mouth. Stop lying. You lie over everything. You lie over big things, and you even lie over little things. And the Holy Spirit is pinpointing it today. And He's saying, repent and change. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. What do you need to give to the Lord today? Give your life to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. Give your sins to the Lord. Yield. Submit everything to Him. I'm telling you, my friends, time is running out. You need to do business with God. Henry Martin said it so well. It should be the business of every day to get prepared for your final day. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Lastly, as you come, you come and pray as you need, as the Holy Spirit leads. You come pray. Lastly, I want to pray for our country today. God, you see the state we are in. You see the rebellion. You see the lawlessness. You see the sin, the rampant sin. You see the sexual immorality, God. And if you said these things to the city of, of Thyatira, oh God, what would you say to the United States of America? What would you say to preaching Christ church today? What would you say to our city, to our community, to our region? What would you say to us, Lord God? Help us in the name of Jesus. So God, come on church, I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to pray with me right now. God, we speak against the darkness that's in our country, God. We speak against the darkness that's in our politics, that's in our government, Lord God. We speak against these radical agendas, Lord, that is trying to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's trying to pull this country apart. God, we speak against it in Jesus' name. And we remind you, oh God, how you turned the tide in history. How men of prayer and people of prayer turned the tide of history. And we're asking again, oh God, that you would hear our prayers. 
that out of our churches and out of our pulpits would cry repentance to the country, Lord God. That over airwaves, television and radio and apps and internet and websites and YouTube, oh God, may the cry of repentance go forth, Lord. Help us in a mighty way. Help us, Lord God, in this hour. In this hour, not later, Lord, help us now. You are a present help in our time of trouble, Lord God. Save our people. Save our country. Save our government. Save our democracy. In the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God. And Father, I pray for every person that's praying for life change. Every person that is repenting of sin. Every person that says, I'm not going to go the way of Jezebel. Every person that says, no longer am I going to condone sin in my life. I'm going to condemn it in Jesus' name. Oh, God, help us to condemn sin in our life. Help us to rid our lives of anger and malice, of slander and gossip of hatred and envy. Help us to rid our lives of these things. Help us to not get entangled in sin or entangle ourselves back into that yoke of bondage, Galatians 5.1. It's for freedom that you've set us free. Hallelujah. 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 So God, help your people today. Help your church today. Help our families today. God, help our children today. Help our children. Turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers. Turn their father's heart back to the children, Lord. Give grace in this hour. God, we're up against what I don't think the church has ever been up against. So many voices. So many agendas. So much darkness. We've never seen a day that we're seeing right now, God. We've had uh, times of turmoil. Oh, certainly, Lord, times of turmoil. But God, there's a different level of hostility in our culture right now, Lord. There's a level of intolerance in our culture right now that's never been known by any other church age in this country. So God, we need your wisdom. We need your protection. We need your guidance. What we need is the Word of God and the Spirit of God to be in our lives every day. Help us, Lord God. Rescue us. Come and deliver us, Lord, from this present evil age. Thank you, Lord. In the name above all names, In the name of Jesus.